Lesbians and gays support the minors. I'm actually not sure how popular at all this movie was or is. How well known it is, I should say. The reason I know of it is just like a complete fluke of happenstance. I was at a lefty college in 2016 attending school there. I was at the time very active in all the student clubs and everything. And this one club, I forget what it was. I forget which club it was. One of the lefty activist clubs might have been like For the Women or something like that. For one of their events, they had a movie showing of this movie actually as an illustration for how intersectional thinking works, or rather intersectional political strategy building the political coalition of the left, how it came to be, how this weird unexpected alliance of labor unions, the gay rights movement, black, brown, every color people, more recently trans was tacked onto that, third wave feminism, so abortion, wage gap, stuff like that, people who believe that climate change is real, how all of these groups that at first glance you wouldn't expect they have anything in common, how all of these groups sort of came together under one umbrella of left-wing ideology. This movie called Pride, it came out in 2014. It is set in the year 1984 in London. This is during the Thatcher years, Margaret Thatcher, and during the Reagan years in America. This is, I get the impression it's closer to the beginning of the AIDS crisis. There's two main protagonists that I want to focus on. Well, three really, but I'll introduce the third one later. The first protagonist I think is meant to be a more relatable character, specifically for the people who aren't yet completely absorbed obsessed into politics and activism, meant to be a character for those not completely indoctrinated people to follow him on his journey into activism, probably meant to soften their view of getting super involved in activism the way the people in this movie are. This first character, Bromley, finds himself in the wrong place at the wrong time, I guess, at a gay pride protest in London, and just sort of through mishappenstance, imagine like a parade like they used to have, if you can imagine those huge banners with like a pole on each end and they need a person to hold each of the poles to have the banner held up. Bromley goes into this parade in one of the opening scenes, and just wrong place at the wrong time, someone hands him one of these polls, hey, I'll be back later. And it's very obvious that up until this point, he was just a passive follower of the gay rights thing, didn't want to be super active, and certainly didn't want his face in the newspaper associated with it. But suddenly, here he was in the thick of things, someone handing him that poll, and now he's marching through the streets publicly, carrying that banner and talking to the people around him. The other protagonist, Mark, on the other hand, is already balls deep in this, no pun intended. In fact, he's so wrapped up in the activism, the parade planning, the coordinating side of it that he notices something. He notices a news story about a workers' union in Wales, a union of miners, people who work in the mines, going on strike over there, heavy police response to that, and around the same time, a much lighter police response than usual to all the gay pride protests. He puts two and two together, here's a direct quote, my guess is that they went somewhere else to pick on someone else. My guess is that while we're enjoying a temporary reprieve, Steve they're giving these poor sods the shit we usually get." End quote. And out of nowhere, without having met any of these people at all, and despite the stereotype that an old rural mining town in Wales is probably going to be anti-gay, this guy Mark starts going around to all the gay rights activist friends that he has in London, and collecting funds to send to these striking miners, money to support their strike, to keep them able to go on longer, to support them and their families during the time that they're not working because they're on strike. Talks to people about this, gets a hand of people involved in this, even though a lot of people don't want anything to do with it. A lot of his gay friends who are in the gay pride scene, I mean. And he ends up starting an official, well, official, unofficial group called Lesbians and Gays Support the Minors. And they go around on the streets at gay events and nightclubs, stuff like that, go around with buckets collecting money for these miners. And Bromley, once again, is seen to be overwhelmed by what's going on around him, but willing enough to go with the flow and let himself get dragged into it, even though he feels a lot of apprehension towards it. And there's also a period of time where Mark and his friends are going through phone books, calling up people whose name they hear in the phone book. Hey, do you want to donate the minors? Oh, yeah, what group are you with? Lesbians and gays support the minors? Oh, um, yeah, I'll talk to you later. And even trying to call up unions and find out where specifically to send the money to. And there's frustration because the name and the association with gay pride does scare a lot of people away, but nevertheless, he persists. In fact, after being stonewalled by the union itself, the group has a meeting where they decide they're going to go around the union and contact directly directly one of the towns where these miners live, and see if there's any place there they can donate directly to. And by some happy chance, they do find a place that's willing to talk to them. And here is where I will introduce the third protagonist. His name is Jonathan, and he is sort of like the spokesman for this Welsh town. He takes a chance, embraces this help from the gays. The gays end up going to this Welsh town for sort of a weekend get-together thing to have both groups get to know each other and spend time together. That goes well enough, although there are a few key characters who are 
are not keen at all to accept the help from the gays. But other than that, the visit is, for the most part, successful. And then following this, there's an arc where a bunch of people from the mining town, including Jonathan, visit London to get to know people in the gay scene. Jonathan ends up giving a speech in one of the gay nightclub concert hall type places. Direct quote, What you've given us is more than money, it's friendship. When you're in a battle with someone so much bigger and so much stronger than you, to find out you had a friend you never knew existed, that's the best feeling in the world. End quote. And this speech sort of is the turning point, at least in the gay scene, of people dropping a lot of the hesitation they had to help the miners. We see a lot more donations flooding in, we see some new members to the LGSM group. They keep collecting money, and then there's another weekend visit to that Welsh town, where once again people are hesitant to be seen around. Remember, the movie is set in the 80s, so people in the movie are using these words, hesitant to be seen around sexual degenerates, perverts, freaks. Some people are scared for the safety of the gays if they spend too much time in that Welsh town. These are Welsh people saying that, but using that reasoning as a way to discourage the gays from coming because they themselves are uncomfortable with it. And there's this very strong mentality on the gay side, on the LGSM side. It comes directly from Mark, but as far as I can tell, it's shared by the other characters there as well. Quote, we'll help you for as long as you want us to, end quote. Quote, until they tell me to my face that they don't want my help, I'm a member of LGSM, end quote. So we see this determination to be involved and to help the miners, even despite encountering some hesitation and some pushback from the miners against the gays themselves. And through it all, there's an increasing sense of the miners being worried about the optics of being helped out by perverts. Because, of course, that's how the newspapers will spin it. Perverts are helping out this strike. As time goes on, we see the conditions of the strikers getting more and more desperate. We see one of the buses that normally takes people to the picket line breaking down and needing maintenance. We see in the main hall of the town people playing bingo for canned food. Food that the gays provide, by the way. So both the strikers and the LGSM group are suffering low morale through this, and Mark absolutely realizes this, and he knows something needs to be done. And I'll take a brief tangent from here over to one of the side characters. This character is a London gay, but he grew up in Wales, and he hasn't been home in years. First, he has a conversation with one of the wise old ladies of the town. Quote, I'm in Wales, and I don't need to pretend to be something that I'm not. I'm home, and I'm gay, and I'm Welsh. End quote. Quote, what I don't understand is why you never came back before. End quote. Quote, it's my mother. She doesn't accept me. She's religious. She hasn't said one word to me in 16 years. End quote. Quote, and what about you? What words have you said to her? End quote. And following this a couple scenes later, there's a scene where that Welsh guy does reunite with his mother. They end up hugging and talking again, and it is sort of touching. But back to the main plot now. The thing that some of the miners were afraid of, that the newspapers would slander them and tell the whole world that the strike is being held up by perverts. That actually comes true, and it happens from one of the notable minor characters characters, woman named Maureen. She is one of the moms of the town, and throughout all their interactions with the gays, she's been cold, distant, she shut herself inside her house, not wanted to interact with the gays, and finally it gets to a boiling point where she herself calls the newspaper and reports what's going on here. But here's a miscellaneous quote from one of the old men of the town, reacting to this newspaper slander, quote, I don't believe what they say about us. Why should I listen to what they say about them? Pro tip, by the way, the news has always been fake news. Corporate news has always lied to us. It is only only in modern times with the internet that we're able to catch them in their lies, and we're starting to realize how badly and how often they lie to us. Far left, far right, same story, but I digress. The gay scene in London also suffers a bit because of this new slander. The gay bookstore that Mark and Bromley and all their friends use as sort of a planning location, a gathering location, that place gets bricks through the window, and it causes a lot of tension in that neighborhood. But Mark, being a talented political strategist, here's a direct quote from him, when somebody calls you a name, you take it and you own it, and Quote. He plans to piggyback off of this newspaper publicity and plan a fundraising concert. The concert will be known as the Pits and the Perverts concert, which the gays and the miners are planning and organizing together. Question, why should gays support the miners? This is a question that a news interviewer asked to one of the concert organizers. Answer, because miners dig for coal, which allows us to dance in nightclubs, end quote. Lots of planning goes into this concert. Bromley is one of the photographers for this concert. The old ladies from the mining town visit London and go clubbing at the night of this concert. And this this is the start of the dramatic climax of the story, where things go wrong in a lot of places at once. While the people from the mining town, the people who have the most support for the gays that are helping out the strike, while those people are in London for the concert, the remaining people in town hold an emergency town meeting, and they vote officially, legally binding, that the town will stop accepting support from LGSM. And at the same time, Bromley, I believe he must be 18 years old or something like that, because he's still living at home and his parents 
Find pictures in the newspaper of Bromley carrying that banner at the Pride Parade. Find pictures of him visiting Wales with the gays. Find pictures of him at the concert. They ground him, they keep him from going out, they completely isolate him. They turn away any of his friends that come to the door to try to visit him. So one of the key members of LGSM is completely isolated from the group. Mark, meanwhile, has a complete collapse of morale. He's essentially out for the count. So there goes the leader. Another guy, despite Mark giving up, he tries to continue the group. He goes out alone, breaking the group's informal rule that nobody collects alone. They always go out in groups of at least two to go collecting money on the street. Because he's alone, he's vulnerable. He gets beat up by people who don't agree with what they're doing. Ends up in the hospital. So he's out for a while. It seems that everywhere at once, things are going wrong. And then to top it all off, Bromley is watching news on the TV one night. And that's when he finds out that the strike is finally breaking. The strike has officially lost. And this is seen as the most demoralizing thing because it's everything that LGSM has worked for for a period of months, maybe even a year, and all these characters are ultimately feeling super defeated about it. Bromley, when he sees the news, he actually runs away from home and he ends up going to that town in Wales where he happens to see Mark there. And Mark, feeling really angry at Bromley, at the world, really, in his anger tells Bromley that he should run away from home. Well, Bromley actually takes this advice. He goes back home to get his stuff. One of his friends from the gays drives him. While Bromley is inside the house getting his stuff, the mother has some words with the lesbian who's driving the car. Lesbian says, quote, I hope you appreciate him. There's a whole village in Wales who thinks he's a hero, end quote. Bromley comes out, leaves. Mark later apologizes to the whole group for his whole meltdown after the miners refused their help. And then time goes on a little bit. Flash forward to next year's Pride Parade. LGSM, which is still a thing for some reason, is trying to have an official place in the parade. The people organizing the gay pride parade, they hem and haul over it a little. Tell them, no, you can't be here. Then, no, you have to march in the back. There's a bit of bickering over it until, until, until. Several tour buses show up in London. Buses with banners on the side reading, Miners support lesbians and gays. So a few hundred Welsh miners coming to London to participate in the gay pride parade. Out of nowhere, nobody expects it. And this is the happy note that the film ends on. I should have mentioned sooner that this is actually based on a true story. The characters in this film are actually were, were real people. There's a brief montage at the end of the film where it like flashes up each character's face and says, where are they now? And I remember seeing Mark actually died of AIDS, I think. One of the other minor characters became, I don't know exactly what elected office it was, I forget. The Labour Party two years later, because of the Welsh miners vote, ended up officially adopting gay rights into their party manifesto. So the film ends on the note that the battle may have been lost, but a strong, strong, lasting friendship was formed, and that ended up winning the war. Which, yeah, if you look at how far they've come, how much they've accomplished, yes, that political alliance has accomplished quite a bit. Now, here's the fun part of the film review. What all can we extract from this? I'll go back to this quote about the lying news. I don't believe what they say about us. Why should I listen to what they say about them? That is a quote that I think we, in the modern-day political scene, can learn a lot from. Speaking as someone on the right, I see a lot of people on the right buying into this caricature of the soy-drinking lefty, buying into this idea of how pathetic the individuals on the left are portrayed to be. It's like sort of a libs of TikTok thing. I remember in 2016, the right used to be a lot more clued in, a lot more familiar with the left's actual stances, actual talking points. But over time, I think that's been watered down. I think we sort of got high on our own supply as far as making the left out to be these weird losers. And I've seen they do own it when they're called names. Like the Pits and the Perverts concert, they own it. And more than that, they're hardened to it. They're familiar with the kinds of back pushback that they get from the right. They let the names slide off them. They don't change what they believe because they get called names once in a while or because the right gets hot under the collar at what they do. They have a thicker skin than we like to believe with regards to these things. And at this point, if I analyze the left, I would have to be looking from the outside in. But I think I would say that the pendulum is swinging the other way. The left is starting to be more familiar with the right's talking points than they used to be. I do think Trump will win the 2024 election but I think further on down the road that's going to start being a problem for the right. I think we need to get ourselves out of our echo chambers and start talking to people who we disagree with. And by the way, I'll bring it back. I mentioned frequently Daryl Davis. I'll bring it back to him. Be willing to talk to people who we disagree with, human to human, not arguing, but actually talking to them, trying to form friendships, but still being willing to stand up for what we believe at the same time. For instance, I talk to people in the Green Party. One of the Green Party's central pillars is social justice. That does include gay and trans 
trans rights. I do know gay and trans people who I would consider friends. I think that type of lifestyle is absolutely the wrong way to go. It doesn't make me dislike and certainly not hate the people. Maybe I'd be more likely to mistrust some of those people on a case-by-case -case basis. It's sort of like a hate the sin, love the sinner thing. I feel sorry for them more than anything, and I hope that they wake up and realize the things that I'm able to see about the key to feeling fulfilled in life. I think they're limiting the amount of deep life fulfillment that they're able to have by not having, by not at least pursuing a one-man, one-woman relationship, monogamous relationship that produces children. Children whose lives they actively participate in. Children who they love and nurture. I think that not having that limits the amount of fulfillment that a human being is able to feel. Because yes, there have been gays and transgenders throughout all of history, but think of natural selection. Every one of our parents, every one of their parents and grandparents, every generation for thousands of generations going back, every single one of our ancestors that's ever been born has been the result of one man and one woman sexually reproducing, and the vast majority of those, the man and the woman, have stayed together for an extended period of time, at least long enough to raise the child through most of their childhood. I think that much natural selection has done something to our brains and has made it so that we feel happiness, we feel fulfilled when we willingly go along with these natural gender roles, as the left would call it. I do recognize that the vast majority of people who call themselves gay or trans would say that they were born that way, would say that these feelings are inborn, they're unable to change them. I don't think that's true for every single case. And of course, both nature and nurture can play a role in a single person. I think at least some of it but I think a larger amount of it could be attributed to the slippery slope of pornography being so available. But back to my main point, even so, even with these beliefs that I hold, I'm more than willing to talk to people, be friends with people who do weird stuff in the bedroom. Or, I mean, these days you see modern gay pride parades sometimes out of the bedroom. But on to the main message of the movie, which is intersectionality. Here's a direct quote from Mark. What's the point of supporting gay rights but nobody else's rights? Or workers' rights but not women's rights? End quote. It's the idea of looking at all these various, completely separate, oppressed groups, finding the commonalities, latching onto those commonalities, and then using that as a basis for coalition building. The obvious benefit of that we see at the end of the movie, with the labor unions coming in strong to help the gays and lesbians. But also there's another scene earlier on in the movie where they visit the Welsh town, they realize that some of the miners have been put in the local jail for things they've done on the picket line. And the gays who've been dealing with this stuff, dealing with the police for years, they give the people in the town a lesson on basically the British equivalent of Miranda rights, what police are and aren't allowed to do, how long they're allowed to keep someone in custody without charging them, and based on that information, the people in the Welsh town are able to go to the police station and tell them, hey, you're not allowed to hold these people in here, you have to let them go, and they got their minors back. So apart from even the obvious strength in numbers thing, there's this sharing of information, sharing of ideas and experience, practical experience that goes along with it. There is a definite benefit to getting different groups with different experiences talking to each other and planning together. Now, bringing this to the most practical, most real-world place that we can, what are some potential coalitions that I see that could work out? Well, one of them I am actively trying to build, that is the coalition between people in rural Pennsylvania who care about election integrity, people who want to clean the voter rolls, people who want to get rid of electronic voting machines, and the Green Party, which has a lot of representation in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. The Green Party is a third party. One of the pillars on their party platform is democracy. I don't know if that exactly translates to the same thing. For instance, I don't know if they'd be more worried about voter disenfranchisement in the way that the left often means when they bring up that word, which would be a counter to the election integrity people who are more associated with the right wing, with MAGA, a counter to some of their proposals to get dead voters and get fraud voters off of the voter rolls. Or I certainly do know that a part of their democracy pillar is making it easier for third parties to get ballot access, and I've heard Green Party members also talk about implementing a ranked choice voting system, which I would be a lot less sold on. I've also seen ideas for a national popular vote, abolishing the electoral college, I am pretty darn opposed to. But nevertheless, I think if we focus on fraud voters, because we can prove that people purposely, intentionally, illegally harvest ballots, they illegally register to vote multiple times in multiple counties, multiple states, vote as many times as they can, and that does hurt the Green Party. Actually, disproportionately, it hurts the Green Party 
party. Because they're a third party, and they're just below being a real viable electoral force in some of these deep blue areas. I think with a little effort, with a little push, it would be possible to, in the right district, maybe get a few state congressmen elected to the General Assembly in Pennsylvania. Ballot access is a big obstacle to that, and voter fraud is just one more obstacle to that. The flaws of electronic tabulation machines, I can talk about that as well. And Green Party members who are willing to listen to this stuff and willing to try to get Philadelphia and Pittsburgh to take action on this stuff, I think that is a really strong potential coalition because it hurts the Greens, it hurts the Republicans, it hurts everybody who wants to have one vote for one voter. And who knows, the Greens being a third party, having put so much focus into ballot access, maybe they know things about Pennsylvania election law that the election integrity people don't, or maybe the election integrity people. Focusing so much on the counting process, on the logistics of every step along the way, from the vote to the actual counting and recording. Maybe with our knowledge of that process, we can help the Green Party learn a thing or two. We won't know until we get people actually sitting down and having these conversations with each other. Another potential coalition I see, though, is I mentioned a few times on this channel a group over in the UK called Patriotic Alternative. One of their prominent members, this got a lot of news coverage at the time, he was sentenced to two years in jail for putting up stickers with phrases such as white lives matter, it's okay to be white, stuff like that. Patriotic Alternative has put a lot of focus into the conditions of his prison stay, sending him letters, reversing a danger to children status on him, and also their are starting to get a lot more organized with doing the same thing for other members of their group who are in prison for political crimes, for sp crimes of free speech, for crimes that should not be crimes. Well, I happen to know an organization in the United States that's been focusing for the past few years on the January 6 prisoners, mainly focused on sending mail to them, but also tracking each of their cases and being a database of all the few hundred of them, a place where people can go to figure out how they can support these J6 defendants. That group is the Patriot Mail Project. Now, of course, the prison laws are going to be much different between the U.S. and the U.K. The criminal justice law is different. But all the same, I would wager to say there are things that these two groups can talk about, can teach each other if they sat down and had these conversations. I believe that we can and we should do intersectional coalition building on the right wing. And something else to note, these groups aren't necessarily going to like each other by default. With the Patriotic Alternative Group and the Patriot Mail Project Group, Patriotic Alternative in the U.K. are actually ethno-nationalists, they do very much believe in nations that are focused on one race, governments and laws that are built for one race that is the predominant race of the nation. On the other hand, Patriot Mail Project is mostly MAGA, Trump supporters, people who aren't on board with the whole racist thing, even though the left calls us racist, and people in Patriotic Alternative might even call the people in the MAGA movement spineless conservatives. And even with the other example, especially with the other example, people in the Green Party, far-left people, would probably call the election integrity group Nazis by default, unless they had a reason to start talking to us. And a lot of people, a lot of the right-leaning people in the election integrity circles, would think that the far lefties in the Green Party are just weirdos. So there would be stigmas to overcome on both sides there. But throughout talking to people on the ground, conversations I've personally had, I can attest I think it is possible to overcome these challenges.